Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Star says everyone's great. How are you guys? We're great, aren't we? Welcome to the first session of uh, Helicon West for the fall um, semester. Yeah. We're glad that to, to have a, a good crowd here. Glad to, to see everybody. Um, my name's Chad, and I'm one of the guest readers tonight, so thanks. I'm really appreciative of everyone who came. Even if you didn't come to see me, <laughs> and especially if you came despite my... <laughs> going anyway. Um, so we have some guest readers and we'll have open mic as well and we're going to open with uh, some, some uh, uh, open mic readers but before that we have some business to attend to. First of all, uh, taping for us tonight is Amias Shipley. Amias Shipley and if you would not, uh, if, if you don't care to be on tape and be on YouTube you can request Amias to turn the, the camera off if you have, if you're going to be reading top secret material, for example. <laughs> so uh, he will turn that off if you would like him to. Uh, second, uh, we would like to thank the Logan Library for hosting us, as always. We have this nice, stable facility. And I don't know if you've noticed, but they have moved, this is the Bridger room, and they've moved Mr. Bridger's painting from the back of the room where he used to stand in judgment of you with his piercing <laughs> gaze. He's over here now. I don't, I'm not sure it's going to work as well. <laughs> we have another one of these Sandra Wilson compositions. But thank you to the library. Joseph's not here, but it's kind of our character. We have Star and Mitch here. Uh, Star, the, uh, the founder of our feast. And Mitch, who is still getting kudos for setting up the sound back when we didn't have yeah. in-house sound. So thank you, Mitch, for all those times you set up the sound years and years ago. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, next, we're going to, while we're on the subject of star, this is the next poetry walkabout. It's Words at Work. And I'm assuming this is connected into Writers at Work. No, no it's no, actually it's just, just work. But um, Aaron and some people said, how about for the title we have Words at Work? I thought it was fantastic. So we're going to write about construction guys and work, because we're going to be at Logan High, where the construction zone is. People are going to be working, so you can write sexy work points. <laughs> and bulldozers yeah. will be there. Stop. It's on so that is Thursday, the 21st of September at 520 at Logan uh, High School. We're going to meet at the corner of the north, uh, meet at the northeast corner parking lot. Right, yes, the northeast corner parking lot. Um, uh, by the by, the Logan River, by the where the bridge is, basically, yeah. yeah. One thirty South, one hundred West. And I'm sure this will be on the Facebook page and stuff, so you can look up there. Bring your pencils and papers and be prepared to write. And you want me to publicize this. This is the, for those of you who don't know, this is the Helicon West anthology. It's a bunch of pieces of prose poetry written by people who were guest uh, readers here at Helicon the first. 10 years of Helicon captured in the pages of this book. It's really great. There's lots of uh, great writing here. Um, uh, lots of famous people, lots of completely unfamous people who did brilliant work. And do we have these, or am I just saying this is we available? We have them. You can get them from me. You can 15 get them. bucks. 15 bucks cash. They're also on Amazon. So uh, yeah, pick that up. Um, you can still sign up for Open Mic. Um, just discreetly request the clipboard and, and somebody will pass it to you. But right now we're going to get started with three open mic readers. They are first, Millie, second, Brock. Brock Wilson, are you here? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Me. Right. Yes. Homeboys reading. And then we'll have Isaac, and we'll go to that point. Isaac Tim. Go to that point. Take it away, Millie. All right. Yeah, Millie. Yeah. Yeah. That's a sneak trick to have open mic first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so this is a new poem <clears throat> called uh, Mormon Teenagers. The first boy taught me first to say, I'm sorry for my breasts. I'm sorry that I grew them. They are naughty seeds. 
They came with the fingers and toes. No one asked me if I wanted them. No one has shown me how to store them under my seat. I'm sorry for my breasts, my ass, the way pillow flesh is too much for fingers, disobedient, slipping past what is graspable. Once in church, a male teacher said, girls in the room, if you knew what your bodies were to boys, you wouldn't want to behave or dress immodestly. On Sunday, the girls whose skirts showed pink flesh inches above pink knees are slutty. It's known, guilty because they know what those inches do. My apologies for them are written on my body in the pink folds made when I collapse skeleton smaller to offer all there is to touch. First boy taught me first to make space where body was before. Taught how name fit in my mouth. Sorry, so sorry. Thank you. Wow. Wow. So um, I'm reading an old piece that has become a new piece recently. Um, it's called How the Muffin Lost Its Top. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and the epigraph, deflowered and probably devalued my mother. Okay. There was a time when I thought my virginity was next to godliness, but on the eve of my high school graduation, I lost that mentality about as quickly as I could get my ankles above my head. It should have been my very first notion that I would know, could not, carry on an abstinent, cel celibate lifestyle as I entered the dark, dismal cor corridors of young adulthood. But the novelty of the pious, pedantic lifestyle of waiting quickly wore off. <laughs> my first time for the sex-positive lush like I've come to be was legally death-level quiet. My first boyfriend, Austin, had all the corn-fed, blue-eyed, Troy Bolton charm I could, I could hope for. His shoulders were broad and his chin was dimpled, and to be frank, I had never been sexually attracted to someone in buckle jeans until I met him one night at a bar mm -hmm. at a Bad White Sound concert. Six months later, with shadows cast on my face like a svelte film noir femme fatale, I thought at the time, I told him I was ready to give it all away. Maybe it should have been indicative that I wasn't actually emotionally mature enough, as I still refer to my virginity as a sentient it. But I'm not about to defend the actions of an 18-year-old who still had baby fat on his face. When we arrived at my family's long dormant cabin in Bear Lake, cap and gown still scrunched up in my messy back seat, Austin insisted I take a walk around the lot at least five times while he got things ready. Right, nothing gets me in the mood more than exercise, I said. Don't be a bitch, he replied. Just take your time before you come back. I put a hand on my hip because at the time I was a caricature of a gay youth. It'll be worth it, he said. When I found him an hour later, there were rose petals and tea lights leading to the twin bed I no doubt shat in as a child. Austin, <laughs> Austin stood in the doorway in tight black boxer briefs, a nervous smirk on his face. Somehow he could be a cocky bastard and an anxious wreck at the same time. I slipped my t-shirt over my head, slowly like I'd seen in every 90s rom-com I had ever seen. With my arms and chest bare and The Cure playing in the background, I'm serious, The Cure was playing in the background, I dove into something I was sure I'd be good at. I expected it to be like Bridges of Madison County, the two of us panting soft, soft sobs on each other's faces, an aesthetically flattering dim light. Up until then, I had no context for sex, just that I wanted to have it and be good at it. It was awkward, sweaty, and God, so physically taxing. Ironically, he forgot a condom, but in all my naivety, I whispered, it's okay, it's both our first time. <laughs> it was one of the only times I stayed in a partner's arms the whole night. As he slept, his tiny inhales and exhales sent little bursts of burning air down the nape of my neck. His skin left its mark on mine. His scent was on my hair and hands for weeks. It wasn't some rough and tumble club hookup or a sordid sensual romp or even a burst of emotion or elation. I had those later. I was the same, the whole of me, except a small part somewhere I rarely let show. I was lighter and smaller, and I've always held on to that. I know, I didn't want to hit you, sorry. <laughs> Have an auto accident. <laughs> oh 
only have one piece, so I can take a long time to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you hear me? You can take that out if you want. What? The mic. Oh, no, I drop it. <laughs> All right, here's a poem I wrote yesterday called Coyote Men. Um, the epigraph. Our prompt was we took uh, things from the Wayland Hand Folklore Collection, which is a thing in our archives up at USU, and this guy collected millions of folk stories and folk tales and family recipes and all these kind of things. And um, we chose them at a random hat, and I chose this one. Victims of blood-sucking witches howl like wolves. <laughs> So that kind of inspired this poem. <laughs> if witches gave their victims wolfish voices, then where did we coyote men get ours? The small yelps that come from every direction, every sagebrush. Where we come, we bring lope and fang. Horses run in circles in the fields, ears laid back. Dogs cower and growl in their kennels. And we come on soft paws down the urban street, across the manicured, manicured suburban lawns, and devour Trixie and Scout, leaving behind bloody collars. We are the all men, displaced long ago to slink in the night, green eyes blinking and disappearing. We are laughing from Santa Barbara to Coney Island. This is our land. You drove us down your interstates when you violated our west, drowned our wild red rivers under cold phantoms of water. We once followed buffalo herds, caught the jackrabbits and cottontail that fled the rumbling earth. Now we eat the dead off your blacktops, your pets in the park. We are the great ghosts in your dreams. We choose when you see us, hear our voices echoing in the dark. We are here, thriving in open spaces, it is not safe to toddle or run your little dogs. We are the teeth and the bristle. We are legion, gods of the red land, the gray hills, saviors of the black mountain. And we will rule long after your dams have crumbled when our rivers run free. Okay, off to a good start. All right, so I guess we will we'll, uh, move into our guest readers. We have, uh, is, is anyone interested in signing up for open mic still? Okay, don't be shy. You can just interrupt me while I'm speaking and say I want to sign up. Um, so we, yeah, we're, we're going to, uh, we'll go into our guest readers now. We have uh, four of us, uh, guest readers from the League of Utah Writers. It's a group here in, uh, it's a chapter here in Logan of the, the statewide League of Utah Writers. Um, just uh, organized into chapters across the state. Um, basically critique groups and uh, um, uh, you know groups uh, that are working out their writing. Um, and our Logan chapter has a bunch of talented people. And uh, I'll, I'll include myself with them tentatively if, they, if they'll agree to it. But, uh, We've got, tonight we've got uh, Amanda Luzader, Felicia Rose, Tim Keller, and myself. And uh, Amanda's going to start it off, and I've been thinking about how to introduce each of us, and I think I'll do it this way. We were at dinner just not too long ago with Star and Mitch, and um, so we got on the topic of uh, the DI, and uh, <laughs> our treasures that we found at the DI. Mitch told us a story about a, a very ornate frame that somebody had painted in like tacky gold flake paint. Um, I told about a, uh, a, a typewriter that I found that was, turned out to be really, really uh, pricey and valuable. And um, Amanda didn't say anything. She didn't talk about her favorite find while we were there. As we were walking out, she said, you know what my favorite thing that I found at the eye was? And I said, no, what was it? And she said, it was a, um, it was a big cast iron rooster. So imagine this big ornate rooster with huge tail feathers, maybe about like this big. And uh, I remembered this. I, I remembered this rooster. It wasn't cast iron. It was a replica of one of those cast iron pieces of art. It was a, kind of a, a plastic resin replica. But it was beautiful, and it had been kind of antique-y um, painted, and it was sort of in her living room as a centerpiece 
with a bunch of uh, kind of dry vegetation around it. It was very beautiful. And when, and when she moved into her new house, I was helping her move it. I dropped it, and it shattered oh. into oh. Like, like, oh. 10 oh. million pieces. Like, it was just like popcorn. It was like safety glass, you know, like auto glass. It just crumbled. And I told her, you know, every now and then I get on eBay just to, you know, just to look for <laughs> antique cast iron rooster replicas. And I just never ever found one. But Amanda is a very talented writer. She's been featured in lots and lots of anthologies and, um, and uh, uh, collections. And she's uh, here to, tonight to read to you a really great piece that, um, that I'm kind of fond of. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll let her uh, take it away, Amanda. really sad as kind of a downer. <laughs> so, um, what I want to tell you about it, though, is that it is not a true story. So um, hopefully that can give you some comfort. Um, but it is inspired um, by some things that I was going through. My son had some very serious medical problems. Um, and that's kind of what inspired this piece. And at the same time he was having medical problems, my cat was also sick. So obviously, as an emotional wreck. Um, but luckily, they both recovered, the son and the cat, so all is well. Um, but this story kind of came from that situation. It's called Of Crayons and Angels. We take a vote. Chris came up with the idea after the first year of Dylan's treatment. I thought it sounded absurd. Voting to decide if our little boy lived or died. It's not if he lives or dies, hon, said Chris. It's if he continues treatment. If he keeps getting worse, I don't want him to suffer and die in a hospital bed. The doctors had told us right away that Dylan's cancer wasn't responding and that the drugs were taking a toll on his small body. If the tumors continued to spread, they said, the no treatment option might be something to consider. There are medications, said Dr. Baxter, that will make him comfortable. He wouldn't feel so tired, so weak. Organ failure is inevitable, but until then, he'd be comfortable. Dr. Allen put it like this. It's a trade-off. Years of treatment with no guarantees or a few peaceful months at home. But how can we give up, I asked. That's why we're voting, said Chris, and it will have to be unanimous. And so, if things got bad enough, we'd vote. Continue treatment or bring Dylan home. Only the people most important in Dylan's life would get a vote me and Chris, Dylan's old, older brother David, his three grandparents, two aunts, and of course, Dylan himself. A no vote meant we'd keep him in the hospital. A yes was a vote to bring Dylan home to die. I agreed to the plan, but I knew I'd never vote yes. Dylan wasn't even acting sick when we found out. We'd gone to see about a weird bump on his abdomen just below his ribs. On my phone, I have a picture of him clowning around in the waiting room, big cheesy grin, a photo of our world just minutes before it fell apart. The technician didn't seem concerned either. Watching the playoffs, he asked us. We shrugged, not really, I said. He talked about it anyway, games, seeds, brackets. Then he stared at the monitor and was quiet. I'll be right back, he said. He stepped out, and when he came back, a doctor was with him. They clicked through the images, browsed, knitted. The technician pointed, the doctor nodded. What's going on, I asked. There's something unexpected, said the doctor. <clears throat> I stepped into the hall and closed the door. My hands began to shake. When the door opened again, there were three of them, and I knew something was very wrong. Could we have you go back to the waiting room for a little bit, asked the technician. I called Chris. Honey, could you come to the specialty hospital, like now? Why? What's up? I don't know. Could you just come? I didn't cry at the doctor's office. The shock was too great. Like a car wreck, the whole vehicle smashed up, and there you are on the side of the road. When the doctor gave the sickness a name, I realized that Dylan might die. I pushed it from my mind a thousand times, but it always came back. How do you tell a six-year-old that he is really, really sick, 
when he feels fine. Dylan was my sportsy boy. I don't know where he got it, certainly not from me or Chris. He always wanted to be on some team, basketball, baseball, soccer, and that was what he was most upset about. You're not going to be able to play soccer this year, buddy. He cried a little, chin quivering. That hurt. Because if I felt so bad about that, how could I tell him he couldn't play with friends, that he'd be living at the hospital? My mother called and said, we've all got to kick in on the prayers of faith. I clenched my jaw. My mother was a devout believer. She'd taken me and my sisters to church when we were growing up, but I didn't believe anymore, and she knew that. I didn't reply, and so she continued, God acts in mysterious ways. This is going to teach you to rely on him. Mom, stop. I wanted to ask how there could be a God who would let children suffer like that. If there was a God, he sure seemed like an asshole. Even if you don't believe, said my mother, I'm praying for Dylan every night. It wasn't comforting. Prayers were just one-sided conversations to ima imaginary people, the same as writing letters to Santa Claus. Where was God as they stabbed my boy and filled him with poison that made him vomit and took the light from his eyes? One night, months later, I awoke on a hospital room pulled out to the sound of Dylan crying. Dylan was curled up, holding his knees. Mommy, it hurts. He was crying so hard he could barely breathe. His face was flushed, his skin hot. I know, sweetie, I said. The tangles of IV tubes prevented me from picking him up and holding him the way I wanted to, the way I needed to. For hours and hours he cried. I pressed the call button for the fifth time that night. Please, I begged the nurse, do something. They put something in his IV and Dylan finally slept. I slid the chair closer to his bed and brushed the hair from his face. He'd lost so much weight, his skin so sallow, but for a moment, he looked like an angel. After two years of ineffective treatments, we were all battle weary. Dylan was always sleepy, irritable. My little cheeser hardly smiled anymore. One evening, he sat on his dad's lap in a hospital recliner. Hey, maybe we can play tennis this summer, Chris said. We all knew it would never happen. Do you like that, buddy? Try some tennis? Dylan twisted, burying his face in Chris's shoulder. Then Dr. Baxter came in and beckoned to Chris and I. My sister took Dylan, and Chris and I followed the doctor to his office. The, this week's results are disappointing, he said. There are other approaches, but Dylan's too weak to keep this up for long. It might be time to think about hospice care. What other approaches, I asked. Chris left the room. I called hospitals across the nation, contacted other parents, pleaded for help, but everyone said the same thing. Dylan was too sick, too weak. That night, Chris found me in the corridor outside Dylan's room. Julie, he said, we gotta talk. He squeezed my hand and started to cry. I can't do it anymore, hon, and I don't want his last days to be like this. I want to take him home. He wouldn't last two months, I said. Chris looked at me, his brown eyes speaking of hurt. It's time to vote, he said. You know it is. Fine, I snapped, but there's no way I'm giving up. The next morning, we gathered beside Dylan's hospital bed, trying for his sake to keep back our tears. Chris gave us pens and slips of paper. Remember, I said, it has to be unanimous. Wait, said David, what's a yes mean again? Yes means Dylan comes home, Chris said. Yes means Dylan dies, I thought. If I stay in the hospital, said Dylan, I'll be able to do tennis, right? The adults traded a series of dismayed glances and no one said anything. Right, Dylan repeated. We're not sure, Dale, my sister Heather said after what seemed like an hour. We'll have to see. We wrote down our votes and passed them to Chris. Five of us voted for him to remain in the hospital. Four voted for hospice care. I'm not sure what Chris expected, but he dropped the slips of paper, grabbed his jacket, and stormed out. Everyone else stayed. We talked and played cards and watched the TV, but there was a heavy feeling in the room. Let's hold hands and say a prayer together, my mom said. Okay, for Dylan, 
I couldn't. I couldn't stay in there, knowing she'd be praising God for his goodness and benevolence while cancer devoured Dylan. As I reached the door, I caught my mother's look of disapproval and frustration. I didn't care. I wouldn't use religion as a crutch or a drug. Out in the hallway, I sat on the floor against a wall. A few minutes later, Heather joined me. She makes me so angry, I said. Heather shrugged. People cope with things in their own way. He's my son. I won't have him believe that if he just prays hard enough that maybe God might heal him, or maybe not. There's no God, Heather. There's no heaven. It's all just made up, and it's not helpful. Not at all. Heather fiddled with her shoelaces, but I felt myself going into rant mode. Mom told me about that. Co-workers of hers, Bill, doctor said he was going to die. But then the whole congregation prayed for him, and now he's fine. So I said she could do the praying for all of us. And do you know what she said? She said, what if my prayer was the one that was missing? Can you believe that? Like, if I don't pray, God's going to kill Dylan. So I asked her, what about all the prayers for all the people who die anyway? And she said, well, for them, it's God's will. So if it's God's, God's will anyway, why should anyone pray? Huh, Heather, if it's just up to God anyway, what difference does it make? She shrugged again. But why does it bother you? Because it's lies. It's a con, and it won't make any difference. I broke into a sob, and Heather hugged me. In only a few weeks, things went from bad to worse. Dylan seemed to deteriorate by the day. I'd look at him and see just a shadow of the energetic, sporty boy he'd been. After the first boat, I'd stayed the night with Dylan, and I'd looked at the boats. I found Dylan's ballot written in his grade school scrawl with red crayon. Dylan's color. So as miserable as he was, he had voted to stay, and that knowledge alone carried me through the next few days. I wasn't there when Dylan's heart stopped. Technically, he was dead for a full minute before they revived him. No one wanted to say it, but after they brought him back, he looked dead. His skin was pallid, eyelids and lips purple. It seemed like his remaining energy and personality had been sucked away. Chris and I weren't talking much those days, so it was his sister Peggy who told me there was going to be another vote. It didn't surprise me. What did surprise me was the result. Seven votes for hospice care, and just my vote and one other written in red crayon to continue treatments. Dylan fell back asleep quickly after the vote, and Chris offered to stay the night with him, so I went home to rest. Heather came with me, and David went with his grandparents. You voted for hospice? I asked Heather as she drove. She stared at the road. You know, I can't begin to know how you feel, but I love Dylan, and seeing him like this, she paused. It might be time to let him rest. How can you say that, I blurted. Everything could change in a day. There's still more we can do. Heather glanced at me, her eyes moist. You really believe that? Did you see Dylan's phone? He's not giving up. Heather swallowed. swallowed. Or is he just doing what he thinks his mom wants him to do? No. No, I shook my head. At, but the thought lingered in my mind, and of course Dylan got worse. It was obvious he could go at any minute. I was in the hospital alone with him, watching him struggle for breath. It was two in the morning and the lights were off. I sobbed and sobbed as I held Dylan's hand and I didn't even notice that Chris had entered the room. He put his hand on my shoulder. Honey, let's bring him home, please. I nodded, but I didn't want to be the one that made that call. And so I said, another vote. The next morning I felt hollow as I wrote yes. Yes to bring my baby home. Yes to let him die. Chris and I opened the votes together. I was certain of the outcome. First was David's vote. He'd written yes and drawn a frowny face with tears, with a tear. The others had voted yes too. But then I unfolded the last vote. Dylan was so out of it I hadn't even realized he'd voted. But there in big red capital letters, Dylan had written no. Was Heather right? Was Dylan voting the way he thought I wanted him to? 
I grabbed Chris's arm and showed him. Honey, Chris snipped. He's only eight. He doesn't know. I shook my head. If he wants to stay here, he's going to stay. <clears throat> that night, I remained at the hospital. I was mindlessly scrolling through Facebook when I heard Dylan say, Mom, in a hoarse whisper, I could barely hear it. Sweetheart, what is it? I moved closer. Is there really a heaven? I held my breath as my heart thundered. Dylan looked up at me. Is there a heaven, I repeated. Yeah, is that where I'll go? I wanted to explain that we can't know for sure, that nobody knew, and anyone who claimed to was lying. But instead, I, sh I stroked his forehead. Oh, buddy, of course that's where you'll go. And my heart broke against the lie. What's it like, he asked. Well, I'm not really sure. I think it will be nice. I know one thing for sure, there won't be any cancer. Tears rolled down my face, and no hospitals. And you'll be able to run and play. Can I play tennis and soccer? Oh, of course. You'll be the star of the team. <clears throat> what about you and Dad and David? Well, maybe, maybe heaven's not that far. I shuddered with the crying, but tried to smile. Maybe if we really concentrate, we can talk like we do now. And it's nice, the best. He nodded and sat quietly, his small hand in mine. After a few minutes, he fell asleep, and I sat there knowing there was no heaven, knowing I didn't believe, but hoping with all my soul that Dylan did. The next morning, Chris gently shook my, shook my shoulder to wake me. Dylan wants to vote, he said, right now. It was only the three of us, but we agreed it was enough. We passed around the ballots, wrote down our answers, and folded them. Chris and I both voted yes to ending the suffering. The last vote lay on the bed. Chris picked it up and handed it to me. I unfolded it. With his red crayon, Dylan had written, I want to go home. Next is Felicia. Don't come up yet, Felicia. <laughs> I was only confirming that that was the order. <laughs> um, Felicia is an incredibly talented poet and writer, and um, she's a member of not only the League of Utah Writers, but also Poetry 3, with Star and all the rest of the mega superstars of uh, the Cache Valley poetry scene. And um, she's been coming to League for, I don't know, five years maybe? Three? Three years? I guess you've just freighted us with so much knowledge and experience that it seems longer. Um, and uh, she's uh, here to read us um, uh, something about religion and food, if I'm not mistaken. So come on up. All right. <laughs> That's a hard piece to follow. And, um, spoiler alert, um, there's no death in my piece. So this is from an anthology called The Way to My Heart, an anthology of food-related romance. <laughs> okay. and can you hear me without that? Pull, pull it all the way down so that you can yeah. Yeah. stand behind yeah. it. And, like yeah, that? okay, that's good. Okay. That'll be better. <clears throat> okay, there's um, one word that I use in this um, shiksa, which you may or may not know. It's a Yiddish word, and it refers to a non-Jewish woman, usually blonde, who is a temptress and tempts good Jewish boys. <laughs> or, yeah. or okay. okay, so it's called Mormon and Jew, a romance in food, and it's told in two voices. Felicia. It's a mid-July afternoon. I could be strolling along the river in our northern Utah town or sitting on the porch reading May Swenson poems. Instead, I'm laboring in the kitchen, freezing and drying 60 pounds of cherries. Why? Because cherry season is on. And according to my wife, Monty, who orchestrates such tasks, our food storage has become dangerously low. I know what she means. The quarter cow we received in December has dwindled to a mere one-fifth. 
The venison jerky is slowly disappearing, and the trout is six pounds away from gone. In our cellar pantry, the size of a New York apartment, an entire shelf lies bare. Should the apocalypse hit, she says, mark my word, we'll be happy we have it. Ladle in hand, I scoop cherries and nod. I come by it honestly, she adds, her expression one of unease. Look at how my parents live. How can I miss it? True to their Mormon pioneer heritage, buckets of wheat and beans and corn cover two basement walls. Storage freezers packed to the brim line the third. Boxes and cans and jars peek out of cupboards and from beneath tables and beds. Open the closet and be greeted by barrels of oats. This is a land where people haul truckloads of potatoes from Idaho and buy cans by the case. Monty. Everyone knows Jews are neurotic, and New York <laughs> Jews the most. But my Felicia elevates the art of neurosis to wedding cake heights. <laughs> Take, for instance, the way she packs my lunch. Rain or shine, sleet or hail, fever or fight, by 7 a.m., my lunchbox sits on the counter, ready to escort me to work. It eases my mornings, and I adore her for that. But come noon, the challenge begins. To free the fruit from the tin, I must summon the techniques of Houdini. Why does she screw the lid on so tight? What's the risk my compote will flee? Then there are the rubber bands. On good days, we have two on each half sandwich. On bad days, three or four. Why? So that the wax paper folded in complex origami does not come undone. <laughs> Has any victual or libation ever sullied your lunchbox, she asks. <clears throat> she has a point. The innards of my lunchbox remain as pure as my love. <laughs> Felicia. What we now call salad comes from the Latin sal, meaning salt. And to my mind, that's what a salad contains. So the first time my in-laws ask us to bring a salad for lunch, I toss arugula and cress with oil and salt. It's lovely, Monty says, but I doubt anyone will eat it. This is how I learned that in Mormon Utah, salad means chunks of canned pineapple with Cool Whip and lime flavor <laughs> jello. I start again. For good measure, I toss in a pinch of salt. <laughs> Monty. I hated attending religious services as a child. The preaching maddened me. The rituals irked me. I wanted to be in the canyon playing hunter and gatherer or in the orchards eating a peach. Not Felicia. I liked attending synagogue, she says. In our small Brooklyn congregation, I was the only child among elderly Jews. I picture five-year-old Felicia, dark ponytail extending from a floral babushka, swaying in prayer among dozens of white-bearded men and a handful of women. Weren't you bored, I ask? Not really. I knew that afterward there'd be a buffet of herring and onions and challah. My wife has curious taste. I shouldn't be surprised. After all, she chose me. <laughs> Felicia. Monty's eyes betray an impish expression. It was the raccoon's fault, she says. The raccoon? Remember I told you about our pet raccoon? The one we drove home on the top of the car? Oh, that <laughs> raccoon. I envision little Monty, long yellow hair tied in a braid, feeding potato chips to the raccoon through the car window. As a child, I'd hide food in the closet for fast Sunday, she said. One time, the raccoon escaped from its cage and ate my marshmallows. I had nothing else to eat. The moral of this story? I'm married to someone who considers marshmallows food. The other moral of the story? I'm married to an imp, and it pleases me to no end that I am. Monty. Felicia has good taste in books. And for the most part, even her musical choices pass muster. But to put it mildly, some of her food is disgusting. Consider her fondness for fish. I'm not referring to civilized fish. A filleted piece of salmon or trout, no. 
I'm referring to the kind that reeks even before she opens the can. <laughs> and when she does, beware. Those scaly creatures, sardines she calls them, look as though they might awaken, headless though they are, but not tailless, skinless, or boneless, and swim out of their oily can. Do you actually enjoy those, I asked from across the kitchen, or do you eat them for health? They're yummy, she replies. It's high time I introduce her to pork. <laughs> Felicia, the 72-hour emergency kit has its perks. Ample and tidy, this Mormon directive contains much one might need should a band of marauders come along and insist we join them at once. <laughs> Still, it can, its contents lack many a staple. Where, for instance, are the bialis, the brisket, the borscht? I see no reason for these crucial omissions. And the flashlight in the same bag as the food? If the batteries leak, we'll die. Better to eat in the dark. <laughs> you have a point, Monty says. She replaces the flashlight with matches and candles. That's more like it, my dear. Now the 72-hour kit doubles as a picnic basket. <laughs> Summer evenings we dine on the porch, candles flickering in wine glasses, our dessert a lingering kiss. Monty, Felicia is in heaven. She closes her eyes and a look of ecstasy appears on her face. Before her sits a chunk of gefilte fish floating in jelly. <laughs> Wanna try some, she asks. Mm. It resembles a dried piece of loofah. <laughs> Maybe not, but I'd be happy to massage you with it. <laughs> How about a smidgen of aspic? She teases my, lip, my lips with a spoon. Just close your eyes and think of jello. <laughs> Truth be told, the texture is surprisingly pleasant. Felicia, some years ago, I came across a recipe for funeral potatoes. <laughs> the chef, a Utah native, had attended cooking school in New York and had gotten ideas. To the 18 or, to the 18 or 20 potatoes and cream sauce, he added a minced clove of garlic. <laughs> Intrigued by the recipe, I surprised Monty for our anniversary dinner with this unorthodox version of Mormon comfort food. It's very good, she says. Actually, it's quite tasty. Her expression suggests alertness, a hint of confusion, though not of distaste. But I ask, but I'm wondering if you added some garlic. You know, my dear, I've been meaning to place a pea under our mattress. <laughs> then again, you're already my princess. Monty, before I met Felicia, I knew about kosher only from pickles. But there's more to it than that. Take chickens, for instance. It's not enough to buy a kosher chicken. One needs to kosher it further at home. Why? If for no other reason, says Felicia, it tastes better that way. So here I am, a shiksa standing at the kitchen counter on a Friday afternoon, massaging salt into the cavity of a hen. And what does Felicia say? I'm sure looking forward to dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. And uh, a little hungry again. <laughs> uh, next we're going to hear from Tim Keller. Tim Keller is a longtime member of the League of Utah Writers and he um, I can tell you this about Tim. He, uh, I don't know, it was probably 2007 or so when he took over as the president of our chapter. And because no one else, you know, has the time or uh, the, I don't know, sort of the mental strength to keep our chapter together, he still is. And he has missed, I believe, two meetings. We, we meet twice a month, twice a month. And in 10 years, he's missed two or only one, two. two. One was when his father passed away, and the other was when his mother had a medical emergency related to the father sort of passing away. And uh, he's, he's the, the captain of our ship. He kind of keeps us together, keeps us working, often at the, at the expense of his own writing. 
and uh, he's also been um, widely published with short stories in various anthologies. And he, today, earlier I was asking him what he was going to read, and he said, I have two pieces, and I'll decide, they're in my folder, and I'll decide, I think he's still deciding, so it's kind of a quantum <laughs> reading. It could be either, it's probably both, but uh, he's here to read us something, and I think it's going to be great. So, Tim, why don't you come on up? Alicia, thank you for, for going before me because if I had had to follow Amanda, everyone would have seen tears streaming down my eyes. I'm like, damn, I mean, <laughs> it's like terrible, but wonderful at the same time. So, this is a flash piece I wrote uh, about a year or so ago called Hair Asylum. I hope you like it. <clears throat> 9 a.m., and already the South Florida sun sent heat waves shimmering from the asphalt. I wiped the sweat from my face. I should have shaved, I thought, self-conscious about the uninvited flecks of gray showing up in my beard. My hairstylist and best friend Patrick was late again, so I lingered in the shade of a swanky beachside strip mall, taking it all in. Urban renewal, they called it. The sidewalks were clean, exotic ferns lined the street. Even the breeze coming in from the ocean smelled like, well, it smelled like ocean breeze. They probably piped that in, too. <laughs> Sometimes I miss the grit, that golden era of Gotham when needles used condoms and the occasional spent pistol shell littered the sand. I was harmonizing with the Muzak version of silver bells being piped through an outdoor speaker when a change in air pressure preceded the familiar whoosh of Hurricane Patrick's vintage Lincoln land yacht sliding into its berth. You're late, Patrick said, extricating himself from a cockpit roughly the size of our first apartment. He was a tall man, a large man. He would be intimidating if it weren't for his sing-song turn of phrase and bouncy gait. I was here before you, I said. I wasn't talking about today, Patrick said, reaching out to tussle my hair. It's what's it been, six weeks? You look like a hobo and not the cute Disney kind. <laughs> well, come on, he said, stepping to the door. What are you waiting for? For someone to turn off that ridiculous music? It's not even Thanksgiving yet. Yeah, he said, like you weren't just singing along. Besides, the blue hairs love it. Jews for Jesus, darling, it's the latest thing. And in this business, what Yenta wants, Yenta gets. <laughs> we came up together, he and me, waiting tables at tackies until we'd socked enough away to move on. Me with the agency, he with the hair asylum, an old barber shop he parlayed into the most prestigious salon on the Gold Coast. Every Sunday, we'd gotten together until the constraints of our respected careers made that impossible. Still, we made our standing appointment as often as we could. Hello, he pressed, brunch is at 10, you know. You ever miss it, I asked, the old days I mean. Oh, sweetie, of course I do. We were thin. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we went into the salon, and this happened so many times before. Patrick morphed into the consummate professional. So what are we doing with, for, for you today, he asked. Just make me pretty, I said. Yeah, sorry, sweetie, brunch is at 10. He was folding my shirt, his shirt collar, or my shirt collar under a blue smock, adorned with pink flamingos, no less. He dipped me to the sink with the grace of a ballroom dancer and began washing my hair in uncharacteristic silence. This was surreal. Patrick didn't do anything quietly. Sorry it's been so long, I offered, and I meant it. Still, the silence continued through the conditioning process, and most unnervingly through the blow dry as well. What, I asked, no blowjob joke? Don't be juvenile, he snapped. Okay, out with it, Patrick, I said, what's wrong? Whatever would make you think something was wrong. Rebuked, but not entirely rebuffed, I decided upon subtlety for my next attempt. One should always approach difficult conversations with small talk, after all, it's only polite. How's Jonathan, I asked, <clears throat> silence. Pat, oh, he left me. Oh, Patrick, I said, rising from the chair to comfort my oldest and dearest friend, only to be caught halfway up and slapped back into place. <laughs> okay, slapped is a bit harsh. I'm sure he was just being firm, but with that angle, but with the angle and gravity and the grip which had twice won him the Nebraska State Wrestling Championship, it was like the felling of a tree. I'm fine, he said. You won't catch me falling apart in the face of pain. My personal tragedy will in no way interfere with my ability to do good hair. 
I flash what I hope is a reassuring smile at the man pulling shiny and suddenly very sharp looking pair of scissors from behind my nervous reflection in the mirror. <laughs> he said I was stifling, snip. He said I was controlling, snip, snip, snip. Can you believe that, me? Hold still, snip, snip, snip. <laughs> uh, Pat, buddy, maybe we should. I said hold still, he said, wrapping a bear sized paw around my cranium like a race car driver holding the knob of a gear shift. I held on while 13 years of anger and frustration of a relationship cathartically unfurled. He told me he'd found new friends. Well, I said, would these new friends move his ass halfway across the country and support him in his dead-end career? <clears throat> Lean forward, Patrick said, pushing back in my head and slamming my chin into my chest. I missed a cacophony of sounds I haven't heard since Edward Scissorhands I held on. It was at this point late in the making, I admit, then I vowed never again to let an emotionally unstable man near my head with a sharp metal object. <laughs> Patrick gathered a fistful of locks. You know what that son of a bitch had the nerve to say to me? Scissors swooped toward my head like an osprey on a trap. He said that I changed. I mean the nerve of this guy. I found I'd lost the capacity to speak. Not that I would have been able to get a word in between curses. Patrick slashed at my tresses, rhythmically listing the things he'd done in an effort to make his failed relationship work. And who was the one that put the lazy bastard through school? Snip, I was. And who was the one that had to put up with his evil fucking mother-in-law every goddamn Christmas? Snip, 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 me, that's who. And another, shit. Oddly enough, the cut wasn't all that painful. <laughs> like a bee sting, I guess, aside from the unnervingly persistent rivulet of warmth dribbling down the back of my neck. Uh, Stay right here, he said. The first aid kit is in the back. There's still plenty of time, he called back. Crunches and tell time. <clears throat> I couldn't help chuckling at the sight of Patrick walking back toward me with a first aid kit the size of a suitcase. What are you laughing about? You, I said. Us, taking care of each other, just like old times. Oh, enough of old times. He removed a spool of gauze. Yes, they were fun, but they were lean. If ever I, hit, I have, ever have to eat another cup, if I never have to re eat another cup of ramen too soon, It'll, or excuse me, it'll be too soon. It's easy to get all dewy-eyed over lost youth and found waistlines, but you're forgetting the crap, he said, his voice now muffled as he held a spool in his teeth. Like dodging grab-assing trolls or paying the rent on our backs, out came the dreaded scissors as he definitely, or deftly cut a length of bandage. So if you're having some sort of midlife crisis, buy a sports car, sleep with someone half your age, and get it over with like normal people, because we made it in this world, and that's not something you should disrespect. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm going to read a piece for you and then we'll transition back to open mic. There's still time to sign up if you'd like to. There's a couple people came in. If you'd like to uh, read an open mic, we'll be doing that in just a bit. Um, I, have a, uh, I, have a, I have an outdoor essay. I won't say it's fly fishing or half sea, even outdoor, it's kind of on the run. Uh, this is a fly fishing essay that I'm writing for a new book project. I'm happy to say that there are three fly anglers in the audience today, or, or are there any more? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, it is fly fishing. This is your last chance to get out. <laughs> um, and I'm writing this, I'm working on this book project about the Wind Rivers, um, and I don't know if you've ever been there or heard about it, but the, the fishing there is, is really, really, every, every waterway and river and drainage has kind of its own peculiarity, like you might have to fish in a very specific way to have lots of success, or it, it might be one, a heartbreaker, you know, it's good one day and terrible the next. And the peculiarity of the Wind Rivers is it's just really good all the time, but you have to get there, you have to go there. And so sometimes the question is asked, well, okay, it's good, but in what way, how does that, that peculiarity exhibit itself? And this is, my, this is my attempt to answer that question. And it's called No Caution in Them. I hope you like it. Again, thank you for coming. No Caution in Them. It's just before 5 o'clock on a morning in August at Big Sandy Lake. For an hour, I've lain awake impatiently as the tent fly displays the first rays of day. In the half light, I sit up and get dressed, head bumping the tent roof. I unpackage myself from the tent like some great insect birthing from an egg sac and then sit in the frosted grass yawning. Everyone else is still asleep. 
The sun is not up yet, but its light touches the mountaintops on the west side of the valley. Everything is new to me. It's all very interesting. Every glade, every waterfall. Even the, even the ground is a source of fascination, a mosaic of miniature succulents, purple, purple lichen scales, and the salt and pepper speckled pebbles that crunch when stepped upon. And the Wind River peaks loom over all, inscrutable brooding gods whose moods shift hourly as sun and clouds move through. And then there is the lake down in the valley of the, down in, in the floor of the valley, its misty surface a mirror to reflect the shades of imperceptibly gathering light. It is, of course, what schools beneath the water that brings me here. The mountains are astounding, without doubt, and the hillside thickets are darkly remarkable too, but I have come in search of water and I've come in search of trout. My waders are stiff with cold. I push my feet down into the neoprene socks and pull them on as I stand up. My fly rod is already rigged and leaning against the branch of a bristle cone. Not long after I reach the lake, the fish begin to rise, just a few at first, but as the sun comes up, their feeding grows so frantic, the lake dimples as though by invisible hailstones. It's more rising fish than I've ever seen. They strike, I, sorry, I tie on a, a mosquito pattern and the, and the trout slam it practically every time I cast. They strike whether it floats or sinks, they strike so hard they miss the fly three times out of five. But I catch fish after fish. Soon the fly is sodden and slimy, then it begins to unravel. And after I hook the 11th or 12th fish, it's just a few wraps of frayed thread on an otherwise bare hook. My first trip in the Wind Rivers has begun. It's the last day of a longer trip. A few of us have been fishing in the rain, but when the sun comes out, I stop and lie in the grass by the stream bank to eat my lunch. Propped up on one elbow, I watch a pot of feeding fish in the creek. They take turns gulping the mayflies that glide down the drift like tiny, sail sh tiny sailing ships. Dave's son, Braden, joins me and watches, watches the fish a while. He's maybe 13, a quiet kid. My fly rod is leaning on a rock somewhere behind me. Braden asks if he can try it. Oh, you fly fish, I ask? I have a few times, he says. I'm not very good yet. Yeah, I say, it's tricky. Well, sure, grab it. Give it a try. He picks up the fly rod and goes to the grassy bank where he waves it back and forth over his shoulder. The line flounces in the air, doubling back and whip cracking. Lower your elbow, I tell him, through a mouthful of trail mix. Keep your wrist stiff. Eventually, he slings the line in the general direction of the stream, of the stream like a burst of silly string. And despite his best efforts, Braden catches a fish. <laughs> it crashes up into the fly and pinwheels glittering over the water. I got one, says Braden. It's unclear if he's pleased about this or not. Yeah, I say. Good job. I assume Braden knows to set the hook, but there's 10 feet of slack line on the water. Got to set that hook, I tell him. Got to do what now? Pull back, I say. Pull back on the rod. It's too late. The fish shakes the fly, but another one takes its place right away. And I don't know if Braden notices, but this one is kind enough to set the hook itself. And then it begins a sort of one-sided struggle, like a dancer who commandeers the lead from a partner who doesn't know the steps. The replacement fish jumps and tail walks, which strikes me as somewhat show-offy, but it stays on the line. Nice of him to be such a good sport. Braden reels in. He meets, me, he meets the fish at the bank, a 13-inch rainbow, respectable for that stream. He unhooks the fish, lets it go, then he rests my rod on, a, on the rock and walks away, apparently under the impression that while fly fishing may be an easy way to catch trout, it's too complicated to be very fun. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. Jason and I are halfway through a five-day trip. We're on a day hike to a cirque and a deep lake where I fished the year previously. I lead the way, Jason follows. On the way there, we pass two other lakes on our left, and we see fish hunting in the shallows like German U-boats. Look, I say to Jason, pointing with my fly rod, look at that big boy. It's a large cutthroat. From 30 yards, I can plainly see his crimson gill plate and anvil-shaped head. He's, en he's edging toward the bank. Kind of far out there, says Jason. He's coming this way, though, I say. I'm fishing with a Tenkara rod, which has a reach of only about 30 feet. In my brain, a frantic calculus gets underway, estimating the cutthroat's rate of travel and approach angle to determine the point where, where I'll need to be when he comes into range. I'm heading west on a game trail about 10 feet inland with the lake on my left. The cutthroat is also heading west with me on his right. As we converge, the chance of him spotting me goes up and up. He's going to see you, dude, says Jason. He stops on the trail behind me. Maybe if I slow down, he'll pull ahead, pull ahead of me. 
Maybe, says Jason. He's getting away. Shit, I say. He's really big. Yeah, he's big. I know. That the cutthroat is big makes the situation quite a bit worse than if he were small. I must not, cannot lose this fish. Losing a fish like this because of a misstep or bad technique would be a terrible blotch on my record. So I go into a crouch and blunder through the chest high alder shrubs, scrambling to stay with the cutthroat and line up a shot. I lose sight of the fish. Where's he at? Still there, says Jason, by the rock on the left. That one? Your other left. See him? Yeah, I say, shit. He's getting away, dude. As the cutthroat nears the bank, I stumble and bark my shin on the stout knuckle of an alder trunk, maintaining just enough footing to continue forward with a kind of clawing, swimming motion. Jason watches bemused as I thrash for open ground so I can start casting. On my line is a big, fat Albert to imitate the grasshoppers that crackle through the air like sparks of unharnessed electricity. They emerge on warm afternoons, advertising for sex by arc arcing up from the grass to snap and flash their red and yellow wings, a core of minuscule semaphore signalmen. The fat Albert is a lumpy and crude imitation, more suggestive of a stepped-on Tootsie Roll than the sleek alpine ornithopter, but it is a durable artificial, constructed of foam that remains buoyant after multiple maulings in the, to in the toothy mouths of mature trout. The cutthroat still doesn't see me. God alone knows why. This fish must be very distracted. Family problems, pressure at work. He's within 15 feet of the bank, but I'm shadowing him, and he's still moving forward. I need to gain another 12 feet if I want to cast far enough ahead of his nose for a nice, conspicuous take. I move in on him, false casting furiously. And he turns around. He turns slowly for a closer look at something on the surface, a midge or spinner invisible to me. The cutthroat takes it. I clearly hear a wet bloop as his beak breaks the surface and then closes for the eat. Now the cutthroat is heading straight at me. I freeze, limbs motionless in awkward attitudes, not even blinking, a landlubber in a, in a game of freeze tag with a water ghost. He swims past. He's tall through the body, slight kipe to his underbite, dark brown, dark bronze back, predatory, confident. He eats again from the surface, Oop. then angles away from the shore in the direction he first came. All at once I'm behind him again, but I've only got one chance to cast before he's out of my range. A flurry of possibly relevant considerations occurs to me. Wind direction, what's in my back cast, if the yogurt in the fridge back home has maybe expired. I make one false cast and then lay the line, the line down, and it falls short. The fly comes down off to one side and behind the, the cutthroat, but it comes down hard. It comes down like a cannonball. There's a splash, radiating rings. The fish detects the commotion, circles back, and opens his mouth to take the fly. Good old fat Albert. I pull back on the rod. The timing is perfect and will result in a very secure hook set, probably in the cutthroat's upper lip where it's bony and tough. The hook catches and the line pulls up out of the water. The rod bends and the fly comes free. There is a procession of poorly conjugated profanity. <laughs> From me, I suppose, it's mostly just the word shit repeated over and over again. I struck the fish, it's over. My eyes follow the fly and line coming up out of the water, and I know that when I look down again, I'll see only a whorl of mud and an eddy in the shallows where the cutthroat had been. But when I look down, the cutthroat is still there. Too big to be bothered by the inconsequ in inconsequential prick of the hook, the cutthroat has come about and is wondering where his meal went. He's not spooked, he's just annoyed. My cast shoots forward and I somehow place the fly right back down on the disturbed water. It must seem to the fish as though Fat Albert had never left the scene. The cutthroat opens wide. <coughs> I know. <laughs> the cutthroat opens wide, his pointed snout breaks the water, looms over the fly, and I rip it away from him. A sudden case of buck fever. Fat Albert rockets back through the water. The line and fly are airborne again. I glimpse the turning tail, fins flatten to the body as the cutthroat flees. But when the line loops forward and Fat Albert cannonballs onto the water for his final cast, the cutthroat 180s around. He's four feet from the fly. He pumps his tail for speed and hits Fat Albert like a train. When his jaws clamp on the fly, he turns on it fiercely, raising a semicircular sheet of water with his tail fin. It's a beautiful take a violent, wild take by a big, aggressive fish. When I play it back in my memory, it unfolds in slow motion. The fish bright, mouth parts radiant white, every droplet of water a shard of sunlight. And I lift the rod, 
upper jaw for sure. The line goes taut like a telegraph wire. It's like setting a hook on a two by four. The cutthroat is hooked. He bolts and the rod shatters. <laughs> <laughs> there is a drastic glassy crack and the whole tackle goes slack. I stagger back and the line drifts down, rod falling forward like a beaver felt sapling into the water. The lower section of the rod has shivered into scores of impotent strips of graphite composite. It looks like, it looks like Elmer Fudd's shotgun after Bugs Bunny stuck his finger in it. <laughs> and I'm as stunned as Fudd, eyes blinking. <laughs> when I regain my senses, I hear laughter. Jason comes up from behind, laughing his big booming laugh. It's the end of my first full day in the Wind Rivers. Big Sandy Valley blazes in red and yellow in a fiery sundown. The planets and stars burn through the dusk, and all at once the place is a cosmic island of granite, floating, disconnected from the world. Down at the lake, the fish start to rise again, just as my campmates begin breaking sticks of firewood with their knees. I head out to fish down by the outlet. I hop out onto a rock and cast. Sometimes I hook a trout, sometimes the trout gets away but they hit and hit. They are mindless, elemental, and there is no caution in them. Neither is there desire or sorrow. The fish want only one thing, to live. And so they feed and breed, nothing else. They don't speak, sleep, or dream. Each time I cast one, I'm reminded of how unlike them I am, how complicated and absorbed I am by the absurd abstractions of humankind, time, ownership, failure. But with each fish I let go, I grow more aware that I am, at least for now, among them. And there are no cell, cell towers or power lines among, above us, no pavement or sewer pipes below. All that lies between us and the center of the earth is 20 miles of bedrock and a sea of age, ageless molten iron. And there is nothing but a thin skin of vapor between this lake and the rest of the universe. Thanks. Oh. And with that, we will um, we will jump back into our open mic section. First of all, a round of applause for League of Utah Riders. <laughs> uh, and we will begin. We have, I'm counting, four readers. Does anybody else want to sign up? Very quickly. We have four readers, so we'll just go, all four of them. Sign Oh, yes sir, what's your name? Rex. Rex, I've got you down. You're gonna, you're gonna, are you gonna read? Start, do it, start, do it. Start, do it. Start, do it. Okay, okay, we're gonna go, okay, so we'll take this in two batches. Uh, first up, we have Nathan Allen, and then Brittany McDonald, and Andrew Simpson. Come on up, guys, and uh, impress the hell out of us. I was just barely thinking, man, I really, really hope I follow them. That'll be really, really awesome. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Nathan Allen. I'm going to read you a couple of my pieces. Uh, this first one is called Mike the Vending Machine. <laughs> Technology has a macabre sense of humor. Chemical burns from safety equipment is common, particularly with airbags deployed at an accident. I need cold caffeine to calm me down and wake me up and cool me off after walking a mile through adrenaline and dry heat. Uphill the entire way with bits of broken glass in the soles of my work shoes and chemical burns on my arms from the airbags. Vending machine Mike, its name is Mike now, as I don't know if I like Mike's, gave me a gift. Three drinks for the price of one, all Pepsi. Some gift. I hate Pepsi. It tastes like Coca-Cola with mothballs and extra sugar to cover the rancid taste. Mike is playing me. I can sense it. Maybe I can say a move ahead. Bruises will come. They always do after an accident, but it's really the smell of the airbag stuck in my sinuses that I want gone. It's ruining the taste of my cigarettes. Some old man who appears to be blind sits on a couch next to Mike, his cane gently leaning against the scratchy maroon upholstery. Do you like Pepsi? I ask him. 
My wife does. I give him one of the cool drinks, and he grins and gives me a nod through his large, thick, black sunglasses. That was nice. Thanks for that, Mike. <coughs> Took me in uh, shaky fingers, pull through my hair, cornstarch and talcum, plumes and fall. The powder covered the inside of my car, surrounded by the explosive toxin turned neutral. It's amazing how quickly something so deadly could become benign from exposure, and how quickly something so benign could become deadly by stopping so fast. Even steel can't handle sudden stillness. It took me an inordinate amount of time before opening my drink. It felt like working my way into a cheap shot of vodka. Now I can't get the taste of Pepsi out of my mouth. I miss the flavor of airbags. Well played, Mike. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> This next piece is called Cricket Games. In something that feels like a fetal position, I sit on the seat of the fourth car at high noon, ignoring the mountains in my view. I'm not myself. The tiny things in my head grope some asshole, a finger all the way in, ignoring the big picture. Destiny is bending me over lately, making me her little bitch. In a way, I'm begging for it, and I never beg. I'll stop when I want, I tell myself. Our egos fill the tracks we set for ourselves, a course we set for no reason but for reason's sake. We like to feel punished for our discretion and lust. Like it's part of the path that needs to be taken through a hill that requires a tunnel, it makes us feel strong like the molten engine that carries so much on a track that's been laid out by someone who knew what the hell they were doing. A toy for someone who pretends they know where we belong. I hear a cricket in my cabin, and suddenly I don't feel alone as it sings to me. It's just a common cricket. I have just now fallen in love with common crickets. I coo back in hopes it will answer, but I scare it away. What games we play. I wonder if it knew it was a game. Nothing changes in the weather. Nothing. It's just hot outside and muggy inside. Too awake to appreciate the passing into dusk, I grip my knees in the windowsill. The cricket chirps the temperature, now from a cabin over. He thinks he hides from me. This is how we boys do it. We laugh at crickets and their inability to understand their stupidity. Thank you. Aww. <laughs> Has everyone just been wow. loud enough? That's okay. Yeah, no, well. Try turning it on. Let's see. Yeah. Let's oh, yeah. Well, there's a switch, and if. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brittany's brilliant, everyone. She found the on switch. I was going to say, I have an English degree. Um, <laughs> pay her will. Clearly, the most technologically advanced category of humans. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Um, I brought a couple things tonight. The first is a flash nonfiction piece titled What We Sew, and the second one is a poem um, called To Awake. But I'll start with What We Sew. Five. It's called Breast Ironing. Mothers in Cameroon take hot, flat tools and lay them against their daughter's pubescent rosebuds in the hope of permanently pressing them. I want to say the reason is rape oriented. A loving effort to protect the garden of their minds against the scuttling hands of a third world country, a white hot pesticide. But breast ironing is done so young men don't fall in love with them and the daughters can have an education instead of children. Four. The first time I stopped going to church, my mother lambasted my youth leaders with her own sprouts of reasoning. It's the woman's role, she told them. Brittany is smart. She wants to grow up and work for herself, get an education for herself. She doesn't like hearing she's a backup plan for a sick husband. She wasn't wrong. She wasn't right. Maybe that's why she felt the need to demand my gaze as she slipped out of her skirts after sacrament meeting, re-emphasizing her idea of why I stopped going with her, sometimes more often if she had visiting teachers come by that week trying to plant the idea inside my blue eyes. She never made excuses for her third world husband skipping church and staying home with me, though. 
Three. Strangers aren't the ones trusted with the deflating of Cameroonian sex appeal. The job is intimate, falls to the female family member in the safe space of home. The pruning begins the season the girls hit puberty. Some are eight years old. Many girls grow into cysts, cancer, breastfeeding complications, and severe psychological damage, all in the name of keeping the garden free from sperm. Two. My mother spent half a summer teaching me useful things at the ironing board about leaving the iron flat on a pair of Julio's slacks. In the bath, French braiding hair down the back of my skull without a mirror, leaving Nair on for 10 minutes by singing three songs so I wouldn't burn my legs, tying a jacket around my waist to hide when I bled through my dress at church. For a minute, she tried teaching me how to sew by hand the teeny crosses that would hold my baby blanket together. I spent hours under the willow tree practicing, pricking myself until tiny silk caterpillars rained down on the navy blue fabric like the plague. One. One in ten Cameroonian girls have their mother's favorite spatula held against budding mounds in the unfounded hope of melting the fat within. In other cases, the girls have elastic bandages bound across their breasts, cinched tighter at night when women are known to be loosest. Crickets chirp between empty thighs, and dry mothers are proud. Zero. For Mother's Day, Julio and I built a garden in the dark. Mom stopped calling to see where we were after nightfall. During the day, he and I had backtracked each aisle of Home Depot thrice, estimating how tall the fence needed to be to keep the dog out, whether zip ties or wire would bind the faux fencing to the wooden stakes better. He let me pick it out a white lattice piece with plastic wood grain that buzzed under my thumb. We erected the garden in the back corner of the yard until 4 a.m., two headlamps flitting back and forth from the garage and colliding in lurches with my nose against the crickets. I was in charge of digging, the metal shovel cold in my hands. Wow. And yeah. now for two awake. I can feel it. <laughs> Full of blood, his need slumming behind my hip bone, 9.33 on Saturday morning. When I don't open, he takes himself in one hand, unzips his phone with the other. Facebook may be my fault. Even if I wrap my lips around <coughs> an oral apology now, he will scroll. Past me, men have come to mow the lawn, a backdrop of blades. My dog howls at the door. Thank you. It's just never fair to follow you. It's <laughs> um, uh, this is a flash piece that I wrote earlier this year and have revisited on numerous occasions and called when caving and according to Brittany this piece makes her feel bad for my mom so when caving canteen springs in the sinks it's unnaturally cold there we left the valley floor hours ago sunlight bleeds weakly through a veil of clouds gray glinting off chipped paint and grooved metal gear to take us into the earth bring us home sagebrush clings to the hillside I can feel the cold nudging through layers of clothing, pressing against my skin, burrowing into my muscles, forcing its way down my throat, causing my lungs to split, slowly oozing blood into the back of my throat every time I cough. Why am I always sick when a trip comes around? Maybe the body resists because it knows that I will suffer, that it will suffer. I give an enormous pine a bear hug, gift a scarf of vibrant purple webbing. Into the maw of the earth, the shunt between existence and non-existence. It's silent here. Warmer, too. It feels sacred, almost, the ineffable presence of age pressing on your helmet, the earth aspirating fetid halitus. Have I been here three times before, or five? I can't recall the way forward. Memory blurs into black spots mixed with heartbeats of light illuminating faces, legs, hands, and stone. I am dismembered by arcs of lightning cast about by headlamps, in focus, passed over, fuzzy, and then lost in the darkness, forgotten in the quiet, buried in a fleshless uh, esophagus. 
I wedge myself further, drop through a crack not wide enough for my pack. I shuck the weight, lower myself in. The bag follows, let down by unseen hands. I am mazed in here. Perhaps I will lower them later, my climbing partners, my classmates, contemporaries. Maybe I will let them down, too. Dry Canyon, a canyon everyone seems to forget. It feels flat, maybe a gradual incline. The trail, in that sense, is deceptive. The elevation profile reveals jagged lurches upward. There is nothing gradual about this path. I am alone here. I couldn't make a call for help, even if I wanted. Bushes with broad, thick, verdant leaves choke the trail, tug at my ankles, whip against my thighs. My breath chuffs in ragged bursts. Colder here than in the valley, as though the mountain sloughs frigid wind into this canyon. Obscured by leaves, by branches, by tree trunks and boulders, something crashes. The sound of life maneuvering a sprawl already smothered in a blanket of vibrant, vibrant fall leaves. I can't see what moves out there. I feel as though blood drains from my scalp and pulls away from my fingers as though my entire epidermis tingles, tuned to the sound like I am an enormous ear. I don't breathe. I don't blink. Angular bulges of yellow-brown mineral press against my ribs, slick and cold. I can't hear the group. They wait, breath billowing in the stagnant air. I twist, press my hands against the walls, legs probe for a dimple, a chip, anything to balance. I hang with my shoulder pinned, organs slosh and then compress inside, crushed by unforgiving sediment. There is comfort in suffering. I kick out and find rock. What else could I have expected? Did I hope it would lead where I wanted into the next chamber and then the next past the squeeze where your hips are above your head and your ribs are constricted and you have to exhale just to move and your lungs are screaming for air but you can't breathe because the cave just offers its damn breath and if you inhale, you'll be fucked. You'll really be fucked. And it's the earth that's doing the fucking. And all you can do is gasp and exhale even more so you can lift your body with one arm and maybe hook a booted toe on some unseen lip and hope it doesn't give, doesn't slip into the emptiness and crash you back where you were, pressed against the walls, unable to breathe, and that toe needs to hold so you can wriggle through the situation you probably shouldn't be in, all the while muttering muted prayers that the ceiling doesn't collapse and seal you, wordless in the unending abyss, knowing that the earth is the one that killed you. The crevice ends, this isn't the way. I clamber back up, blindly plunge my right hand into a freezing pool of fallen pearls, finger deep in frigid mud. I turn and run like I would if someone caught me in their home uninvited. I hope nothing follows me down the trail. I breathe in ragged scraps, my mind already sprints ahead of my body, reading the ground, each rock and root and leaf, and my feet follow two steps behind. Never trip, never stumble. My knees ache from the steep downhill. I keep running. I will run in Dry Canyon within a week. I will ignore the sound in the brush. I will focus on my breath. I will focus on the ache in my calves that starts in my Achilles and stretches all the way to the back of my knees. I will take a long sleeve shirt for the wind. The trick, it seems, is to return and return and push and push and decide, even as I run, which limits need to break, which risks are acceptable, which risks are too much. Up and past the orbs of light, pull my way through the next gap of stone that has aged a million years and listens to my wordless scratching worrying my way into another contortion until I can squat in a void and call out to those that I've left behind, huddled in the beams they cast on one another. My voice flounders against the ankles. They can barely hear me. They follow. I move up, look for a place for my feet, scatter light to find the next step that takes me into the bone-compressing squeeze. I kill my headlamp. The Milky Way ripped in the fabric of the sky will seep starlight when we ascend our rope, labor up at like grotesque, mud-crusted earthworms that inch up a lifeline and leave the warmth of a shadow so complete it feels solid for the frigid vastness of open space. Thank you. Well done. Well done, you know.
when you say something like come up and impress us, it's just kind of something to say. <laughs> I'm supposed to take it so literally. Uh, okay, so we have our remaining three readers. We're going to have Jennifer, Jennifer DeTori. Yeah. Is that what? You nailed it. <laughs> and then the Rex, Rex who is just, just the one name. Just go with Rex for here. And then, and then we'll finish off with the star. Okay, I spent a really long time since I've done this, like, probably longer than some of you have been alive. Uh, so, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is called The Black Bottle. These lines pressed hard, open under the cold, sharp edge. Liquid pulses warm and down, mark by mark another drop. When memory is too numb to feel, each point pierces deeper until once again the life flows out. It's like this, how life must follow death, follows the watery darkness, follows the viscous libation on the heaving altar of our inception, how we are forced through each red, wet sea, threatening to close in on us through until we at last stretch our lungs on the slippery ground of our deliverance to gasp and cry. Piece by piece, I slowly strip off fear, unhook guilt and expose shame until my breast and my heart are bare before. All my secrets laid out along the smoothness of this translucent skin. Hands grasp to find that soft underbelly. Fingers grope vulnerability and gently tug, pulling closer. And once again, I find myself tangled in these sheets. Some men hide not for love of darkness, but fear of liars. We must know our darkness to find light, familiar with its razor edges, deceptive lovers, and Golgothic allure. Stumbling over those stones that wait in shadows to be thrown, hurling them into that inky, never-ending well, and returning to drink, it, to drink its deaths. The comfort of crucifixion is the promise of resurrection. I die daily. Past the strangling in my throat, past the searing in my chest, past this black liquor burns, but it does not let me forget. It pours out and out, swallows regret, splatters over failure, soaks across pages, hands smeared and shaking until remembering spills down my cheeks and into words. In that beginning, words. Next to the pungent tinge of overripe melon, I lay down my made in China cut glass full of amber and illusions. Mm -hmm. to fish the Teton River. Me and my friend Tiny especially love the narrows of the Teton River. The narrows of the Teton River is 30 miles of white water and noise from where the river goes into the canyon just west of Tetonia to where it comes out at Newdale. It's turbulent noisy, and most people don't go there. So we love to fish. It's not that the fishing was better, it was because it wasn't crowded. And one day, we went up early, and we got to a trailhead at the top of the canyon. Now, the canyon's a half mile deep and steep as a cow's face on both sides. But there's a game trail that angles down the side of the canyon for about two miles before you get to the river. And I was getting my stuff out of the truck, but Tiny, always competitive, he has to be the first one to get his hook in the water, the first one to catch fish, first get the biggest fish and the most fish. He said, the math is easy. The fish are in the river, the river's at the bottom of the hill. I'm going straight down. I said, okay. Kill yourself if you want to. I'm taking the easy trail. I'll fish back up to meet you. And so he headed straight down this little draw with a few rocks and bushes to hang on to. And I took the trail angling down the hill. 
I'd gone about a half mile and I was coming around a little point where there was a draw and on that trail coming up the other side, coming up the other way, was a bear. This is not good. You can't really go up the hill or down the hill. And then the wind came in from my back. And I knew I was in trouble. Because I had a dozen minnows in my fish sack for bait. The bear didn't know they were minnows. All he could smell was fish. And it looked like dinner to him. So as he headed around the deep into the draw, I headed back for the truck. I was going as fast as I could go, and I, I always, you know, I, it, it could, what, what was I hearing? Was that bear? I, I wasn't sure, and I kept running, and, and finally I had to look back, and sure enough, the bear was there, but I shouldn't have looked, because just then, I tripped over a rattlesnake that was crossing the trail, and it got tangled around my feet, and I went down just as the bear pounced, and he went over me, and I was trying to get this snake off my feet, and he turned around and jumped on us, and we went rolling down the hill. And there was cussing, and howling, and screeching, and growling, and, and me and the bear was making noise too. But, <laughs> but like a flat tire at 60 miles an hour, we just go whap it a whap it a whap it down that hill till we hit a rock, <coughs> and everything flew apart. That snake went 30 yards straight in the air. And a passing eagle just swooped in and grabbed it, fluttered its wings, thanks for breakfast, and sailed off. I was against the rock with my breath gone, and, but the bear was still rolling down the hill. I turned and watched, and then he disappeared. And finally, there was a geyser of water that came up. He must have gone off a cliff. <laughs> well, now I really wanted to be back in the truck. So I started crawling up the hillside. Uh, at least my hands and my feet were crawling up the hillside. I was sliding down the hill the same way that bear had gone. And that loose gravel on that hillside wouldn't hold the grass in place. And the faster I crawled, the faster I slid down that hill. And finally, I figured, I'm about to go over the edge. And I flipped around to see what was going to happen to me. And just as I went over the ledge, everything went <coughs> slow motion. I could see that this cliff was about 20 feet above the surface of the water. And there was a pool along the base of the cliffs there for about 30 yards. Probably the only smooth water for two miles either way. On the bank, on the other side, there was a nice mule deer butt, probably come down to get a drink. And there was a magpie in a willow bush over its head, but they were both just sort of staring slack jawed at the cliff. And, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye, there was a bear getting out of the river on the other side. Didn't look like a happy bear. Well, I started falling. <clears throat> and about halfway down that cliff, there was a little ledge sticking out about two feet off the face of that rock. And it caught me right there and flipped me in this half somersault. And I just went over and came down flat on my back on the water. Popped a button off my shirt, which knocked the magpie out of the bush. It fell down on the buck's head, got its wings tangled in the antlers. And I don't know if they even remembered about the bear, but they were squawking and snorting and bucking and chased that bear up the other side of the canyon. Well, the current just sort of pushed me up against a rock at the low end of the hole. My head and shoulders were still out of the water. And then up on the cliff at the head of the hole, hanging onto a sage bush, there was Tiny. And he says, are you all right? I don't know. I guess so. Well, get out of there. You're scaring everything. <clears throat> well, that wasn't even true. Because as I'd gone off the cliff, I'd recognized this as a prime 
fishing hole, and I cast my lure to the head of the hole, and I had a nice two pound cutthroat on. And besides <laughs> that, there was a young beaver under my right arm, and there was an otter getting into my fish sack under my left arm. On my honor as a fisherman, that is the way it happened. <laughs> all for an evening of inspired and accomplished readings. Beautiful, tragic, mirth-filled poetry and prose. Wow. So I took down a couple of notes to read for you. Voting to decide. Amanda. Knitted, nodded, the shape that comes back the devout, the imagined, when vomiting pain takes the light from our eyes. We hold to the sallow, the angel who comes near, but we can't stop, can't help what happens. The dying one saying in crayon, I want to go home. In the half light, Chad. Birthing, new, every glade, every waterfall, brooding gods of clouds moving over all the thickets, the water, the rising yellow glaze of morning, unraveling the creeks over rocks that roll with treasure, burst of winged creatures to fish with, dream of a trout hunting in shallows, crimson gill plate, anvil head, cut throat. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>